Well, should we get started? I think we should, man. How's your life going? Uh, well, it was a, it's, it's taken a weird turn. Uh, but, uh, In what way? Uh, well, we were, uh, we were planning to, to host a certain person today, uh, but instead we're going to talk about this certain person. Um, he's very nice, but uh, yeah, sometimes I guess things come up. Uh, but, you know, in life, I think we're, uh, we're seeing incredible spikes in cases in COVID across the country. Um, we're starting to move toward winter. Uh, the leaves are falling off the trees. Uh, I think there's been a lot of conversation lately about what's going to happen with, the, uh, with restaurants, uh, with, with institutional sales. Uh, if everybody remembers, we were seeing year-over-year -year sales dropping at uh, something like 51% month over, or like March to 2020 to March 2019. Uh, so I, I think there's a lot of fear that we're going to see a lot of the same things happening again this winter. Um, Dude, I'm, I'm curious. We've got the holidays coming up. We've got Thanksgiving coming up. We've got Christmas coming up mm -hmm. uh, with the cases going like gangbusters right now for these really seasonal items like uh, turkeys, cranberries. What do you what do you see? Do you do you think those sales will continue and people will just have smaller Thanksgivings in their homes? Uh, or will that well, be a catastrophe for those industries? If, if you remember, uh, we had Brandon on a, about a month or two ago, and we talked about this pandemic response survey. Um, and uh, so we've, we collected data already on October um, about what's going on for Halloween and what people are going to be doing for Halloween. Uh, the next round of surveys, we're going to be looking at exactly that question for Thanksgiving. Um, there is some conversation I know in the industry that is... Uh, Kind of focused on maybe people are just going to be ordering smaller birds um so you're going to have smaller gatherings of families and that thanksgiving itself people will still have dinners but but what they will be demanding won't be the the big bird that they would have usually purchased but but multiple smaller ones uh so so you could imagine a world where this actually increases turkey demand hold on though because turkeys don't work that way right you can't just have a, a full grown bird and then make it a smaller bird. Yeah, true. Uh, presumably well, the, the industry had some notice, right? So, so it's not like the onset. You know, the amazing, you know how like millennials, we're millennials, um, we, how, <laughs> yeah. how we're killing everything. That's like every story is, uh, you know, uh, we're killing Applebee's or we're killing American cheese or whatever. One of the things that they say we're killing are, is large turkeys. Um, so there was there were a, there was a slew of articles uh, I don't know about a year or two ago about the the millennials are destroying uh, the the large turkey <laughs> demand. So we were already seeing this shift I think happening. Um, the the other part of this is you know Thanksgiving was already going to be a contentious time uh, because of the election. Uh, I don't know if it's it's touchy to i i, I mean the idea of going oh, you're back saying home. you're saying you're not gonna hang out with your uncle because you and your uncle just are disagreeing about everything yeah i mean there are like saturday night live sketches about that every year right? exactly like the, yeah um and so you know there was already probably some question marks about what people were going to be doing for thanksgiving anyways but with the pandemic uh, you know, I, I think there are a lot more questions than answers right now. And, and as we step toward this, I think we'll have more answers on the turkey side. On the Halloween side, um, so I, from the data that we have, we're kind of anticipating that about half of the houses are going to be uh, offering candy as usual. So, wow, that's half. much more than I expected. Really? Oh, yeah. You think that's less than you expected? I don't know. I mean, I, I guess I, so, so half of the people in our, half of the households that we surveyed said that they, they generally have candy. They pass out candy to kids. But um, what we're finding is that of that traditionally, we always pass out half candy of group. People. Half of them are gone from, mm -hmm. from this year's offering. Um, and similarly uh, the number of kids that are going to be on the street in terms of parents that are allowing their, their children to go trick or treating is, is really low. Um, I mean, not, that's, that's more along the lines of what I would expect. Yeah, so I would I say think we're, our plan is to do like a Halloween bubble where we only go to uh, a few houses of, of the closest friends of our kids. Yeah, well, I mean, I think a lot of people are going to be doing that. Uh, but that's a that's a big question that I think we're going to be asking more and more as we step into the holiday season. 
Um, you know, I, I talked to the Hill a couple of weeks ago about restaurants and one of my crystal ball forecasts is that I think that the outdoor space heaters are going to be sold out from here until eternity. Um, and I mean, I think we're already seeing that that the the outdoor space heaters are already gone on amazon yeah well, yeah i wonder if we should stop armchairing the future of the world and just dive into well i think this actually fits exactly stuff. into what we're talking about because the 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 conversation that we're going to have as everybody might have noticed the world is hyper polarized right now um, you know, we are limited in what social relationships and social interactions we're even allowed to have um, in terms of, you know, regulation, but, but also just safety and public health. Um, and so we thought this would be a, a great week to kind of talk through um, the economics of social relationships. Um, and uh, so this, I think, is a, the, the right framing, uh, particularly stepping into the holidays where the holidays are really about relationships. Um, and so I guess right now, probably it's worth clarifying. This is something that Trey and I very much disagree on, right? Where Trey comes from a totally different spectrum of economics than I do. Trey lives in this behavioral institutional uh, world of economics. And I am definitely from the other side, the neoclassical um, profit maximization, utility maximization, supply and demand prices and quantities. Uh, and so he can talk about the economics of social relationships or whatever word he said uh, to understand the world. But that to me sounds starts to sound a lot like nothing about economics and a lot more like psychology. So hopefully we can have a pretty good disagreement about what the heck economics of social relationships even means. Yeah, I, and let's do it. And by discussion, I, I anticipate this being a bit contentious. Um, so, uh, yeah, try to offend me. I dare you. Uh, okay, so so I, I know you hate when I do this, but I'm going to do it anyways. I'm actually getting a uh, text about the fact that you went to the bookshelf and were grabbing books. <laughs> well, good. Um, so the book that I think most people um, connect economics to, the, the founding of economics, is this book. So this is uh, Wealth of Nations by Adam Smith. This is just the first volume. There are two volumes. Um, Alex, you've probably never read it, but that's not- I do have a copy. Have yeah. you read it? Of course. Yeah. See, <laughs> okay. I've even highlighted things. What do you mean? Sounds like a waste of time. Keep going, man. Well, okay. So see, I have read it so much that I've even highlighted things. So this is the book that everybody taught, The Invisible Hand and all that stuff. Um, this was published in 1776. This is the one that everybody talks about. This is what neoclassical economics sort of was built off of. However, before that book came out, Adam Smith published another book uh, called The Theory of Moral Sentiments. Um, and Adam Smith in this book, which was published in 19 or 1759, I believe, uh, Smith walked through really behavioral economics and sociology. Um, and so he talks in here about something called the impartial spectator that uh, that's, I mean, in modern day speak, we would just call a conscience. Um, and uh, in at this, so this is where I come from. So I read that one, didn't really buy all of it. I read this one, I loved every word of it. I'm actually much more familiar with that book that you're currently really? holding up than the Wealth of Nations, yeah. Um, this one blew my mind uh, because he, he talks about how, uh, so in behavioral economics, we talk about dual process theory or how there are uh, these two systems in your head where you have, uh, they call it like an elephant and a rider. So you have your emotional knee jerk reaction and then you have your rational brain that tries to rein back the elephant. Um, and, uh, and really that is like straight up out of Adam Smith. So his impartial spectator is the elephant rider and uh, his kind of regular person is the elephant. Um, so, so Adam Smith was touching on really important things. And I, uh, I love this stuff, but this is very old. Yeah, I, I was going to say, I hope we don't spend the whole time talking about the 1700s. Right. <laughs> so when I got to Michigan State University, I happened on to a professor who had been here for many, many moons. Um, so I, I know this is a bad old person joke, but like, this is old. I found something less old than this. And uh, so 
it would have been funnier if he was here, but we're going to push through. Um, so Lindy Robeson uh, has been a professor in the Department of Agricultural Food and Resource Economics for uh, essentially his whole career. Uh, Lindy and I connected immediately. Uh, we, uh, we started doing a ton of work together, just talking about cool ideas. Uh, he's calling me now, actually. Um, <laughs> and, um, so we you keep uh, talking and I'll email him. That'll be good. So Lindy was uh, Lindy was doing all of this work, early career stuff. So when uh, when in the way he tells it is he was doing ag finance and all of his research was focused on agricultural finance. So he was making calculations, etc. cetera. Um, at some point in his career, he said, this isn't how I think the world works. So I'm going to start writing about something called social capital. Uh, and his work on social capital led him to be a fellow in the uh, institutional and behavioral economics section of AAEA. Um, he's, uh, he's got probably one of the most cited papers on social capital of all time. Uh, Lindy, he is a dyed in the wool, hardcore social capital leader uh, in, in the way that people think about this concept. So let's argue about the concept. Yeah, for yeah, I was going to say before we start arguing about the concept and, and Lindy's legacy, maybe you should tell me what the heck social capital even means. Well, because so, when, when you said, ah, oh, we should have Lindy on, he's a giant in this field of social capital. I said, wow, that's a great idea. What the heck is social capital? Right. <laughs> well, so our department, believe it or not, um, the um, so the way that economics works is historically there used to be schools of thought right so you had the chicago school and then you had the austrian school and then you had um the keynesians you had the neo-keynesians you had the marxists etc um so lindy uh stepped into this department with uh, another fellow that was in our department named alan schmidt al schmidt who's a very famous um economist in our department for a very long time um, and, uh, they, they wrote a paper about the idea of social capital in the context of what economists mean when they say capital. Um, and, and, uh, so this paper, if you're ever looking for kind of an interesting philosophical read, it's probably one of the most cited pieces in the social capital literature. And it was published in 2002. So, uh, I was, uh, how old was I in 2002? I was 16, 16, 14. I was 14 years old. Um, so like, I mean, they, they've been talking about this when I, since when I was young. You still haven't even told us what it is though, right? Social capital is defined by this paper and a lot of Lindy's work is the sympathy, empathy, regard, trust one group has for another or one person has for another person or group. Uh, so social cap capital, when we talk about capital in economics, what we're talking about is something that you can take and leverage into creating something new. Um, and, uh, and so the, the idea behind that something new is usually like, I've got land, right? I've got uh, a bulldozer, could be depreciating capital or some asset. Um, social capital says that your relationships also have value. Um, so, so you can build things out of your relationships as well. So there is this, this capital stock that you have of your friend group. Um, well, if you have friends. Uh, and, and so some of you don't have any, uh, as, as Alex likes to point out, I have a lot more Facebook friends than he does. So I'm not I, sure I've ever pointed that out. I think, I think you pointed, pointed out, out a, a no, couple closing I, bells ago. Well, I did, but you pointed out every day <laughs> since then. Um, so, so the, the point is that you have these relationships that have value. Um, there is, I'm not going to find a book because. So this, I have this book. whole closing bell is just about the fact that you have a lot of Facebook friends. Is that what this means? Uh, and that my number of Facebook friends has value. Yes, uh, sort of. But hold on, uh, though. That's not exactly what it means, right? It's uh, not it's the... Not. the. Let me yeah, walk through for it. it. So, okay. so is any, have you ever heard of microfinance? You've heard of microfinance. Yes. Okay, so the idea with microfinance is that there are people in developing countries, uh, particularly, or people in general, who, uh, who need access to capital. They, need to, they want to start a business, whatever that small business might be but they have a hard time starting the business because they don't have any assets. They don't have, they don't own their own house. They don't own their own car, whatever, whatever the thing is. And so there's this, uh, this vicious cycle that like 
is hard to jumpstart. So microfinance says, no, we're going to use this social capital idea and say that we'll give you a loan. And if you don't pay back the loan, we're going to tell all your friends that you didn't pay back the loan and you're going to lose social capital in your group. And that's the collateral that we're going to take for that micro loan. Um, and so that's, that's an example of what social capital does. It's leveraging the relationships you have to create something new. Okay. So there's, in terms of we're going from Adam Smith and you're talking about all these heady concepts like social capital. Uh, I'm an applied economist. So I guess the question is why the heck do I care about this concept? You've explained to me that it's important in terms of peer pressure amongst poor people uh, in developing countries trying to get loans. Can you give me a little bit more practical reason that I should care about this? in my life and my work? Okay, so um, so here are some of the motives. So Lindy has published a bunch of papers on uh, relationship economics and everything. And uh, like I said, he's really been at the forefront of talking about this concept. Uh, so he, he highlights the motives. Um, he, uh, so the idea is that there are certain motives that, that create this need for external slash internal validation within some community. Uh, there is a need for belonging. We all feel like we need to belong to a community. Uh, altruism is also this motive. I, I feel like, like I, I generate some value to myself. Uh, and then the one that economists historically, the, the neoclassical economists would focus on is this own consumption motive. Uh, and that is, that's that's very separate from the other motives for why you do things. So why do I drink this KBS? This uh, this uh, this is a very famous founders beer. Uh, a it's delicious, so I, I drink it because I like it. Uh, but I also drink it because it's a local beer. Um, you know I'm I'm uh, showing my sense of belonging to the state of Michigan by drinking this product. Um, there, there are relational items that are embedded even in this, this drink that I'm having. Um, you know, my, okay, so, my, what? So this is your, I guess you're going back to your Adam Smith. You've got your elephant and your conscience or whatever, your rational side. You're describing reasons to do things based on this elephant guy, right? Uh, what are the, when I look at kind of the, broader context supply and demand what is the share of of demand for something like that that's driven by these social motives rather than uh so the 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 classic lindy example is castaway so if you remember the movie castaway with tom hanks hey there he is yeah hold um, on i just found him <laughs> okay <Lindy! laughs> sorry guys i was thinking we were at five o'clock. Oh, that's okay. Okay, um, I'm going to promote you to a panelist to see if we can get your uh, video loaded here. Shelby, can you make Lindy a co-host? Should have been on the panelist list already. Perfect. Lindy, can you now show your video? Um, let's see. Are you driving? Okay. You may. Let's see if I can see that. If you can't do the video, that's totally okay, man. It's fine. Okay, we can just put up a photo of you. And... Okay, great. <laughs> um, Okay, so, so Lindy, I've, I've kind of walked through, you have the theory of moral sentiments and you have the wealth of nations. And, and the way that these two groups play together is that uh, the neoclassical economists have really latched on to your own consumption motive where uh, the social capital theory is trying to really talk about these other motives. Um, what, what am I missing here? Can you see the screen? No, that's, oh, okay. I would agree with exactly what you said. Um, the other motives we try and account for because we recognize there are other needs besides consumption for, to satisfy physical needs. So these, these other needs um, are satisfied with relational goods produced by social capital. So 
we have different forms of capital producing different forms of goods. So can you talk us through your three types of social capital real quick, the linking, bonding, bridging? Sure. Um, again, I, in, in my opinion, um, Adam Smith really um, set the foundation for social capital when he talks about vicarious sensing depending on the strength of the relationship. So family relationships, uh, he and others that you're living in your house and so on, he would say were your strongest and then you would have others of people that you do business with, you meet regularly. Uh, he would call those um, linking. And then finally you have people in asymmetric social and economic and other kinds of positions. And he would refer to those as having linking social capital. But the key point, they're all connected with some kind of sympathy, empathy, trust, regard, something like that. Okay, so Alex asked me, what, where does this all fit? And uh, so let's go into the relational goods conversation. Um, so I mentioned my beer that I'm drinking here, which is a KBS. Um, I mentioned Castaway, and you have these uh, this this world of you know he basically endowed a character into Wilson the the volleyball, um, and I mean everybody remembers when like like I got a little emotional when Wilson floated away, and it it was just <laughs> a volleyball, but like it was it meant more than the volleyball. It wasn't the volleyball. It was what the volleyball represented. Correct. Yes. So. Um, <clears throat> there are two kinds of relational goods. One is an intangible, um, what we refer to as a social emotional good, which might happen when you, when you hug a friend or um, you, you're recognized in a public sphere or you achieve something uh, noteworthy. And those are intangible goods and they're exchanged within social capital rich networks. Those intangible goods sometimes get embedded in things. So um, you may have strong feelings about your country or your family. And uh, so pictures of your family somehow get embedded with these intangible goods and become like a storehouse for these um, uh, intangible relational goods. And when they get embedded with things, they change, the thing changes its value and meaning. And that was the case of Wilson, the Wilson soccer ball after repeated, you know, spending time talking to, I don't know what happened between Tom Hanks and the soccer ball, but suddenly at some point the soccer ball was no longer a soccer ball and well, uh, so, so one example that i really like that you've thrown out before is like uh like a set of golf clubs so if, if it was just an old rickety set of golf clubs it's valued at you know just like whatever the thrift store price wants to put on it but if it was john f kennedy's rickety set of golf clubs it is now far more valuable than what it would have been as just a regular golf club sure famous people uh, with whom we respect, would like to be like, or something like that, objects associated with them have attachment value. So George Washington's rocker, rocking chair, Mount Vernon, all, uh, lots of these kind of things that uh, we associate with famous people have take on what we call these attachment values. And relational goods are simply both the social emotional goods and the attachment value goods. And there are a number of processes for creating attachment value. And some of them align um, with sort of cognitive uh, biases, um, such as the IKEA effect. When we work on something and we invest ourselves and our time and energy in it, it somehow becomes more than just a physical object. And so one so, of the things that social capital does 
is it introduces a, another kind of production, another way of creating value. And the consequences of that are quite profound. So okay, let, me, when, let me throw out an example of okay. what I, in my head, think of as like a relational good that I don't think Alex will be able to describe with neoclassical economics. And then I want to see Alex try to describe this with neoclassical economics. Okay. 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 So I dated this girl in college. Oh my gosh. Uh, okay. And, and, and this girl. It's going to get weird. Uh, it, it is, it's going to get really weird. Uh, so this girl had a dog that she really loved this dog. Like the dog had health insurance and she didn't. Um, and uh, she, when the dog lost the dog's baby teeth, she saved the baby teeth for a baby book for the dog. It was the weirdest thing to me because right. like I didn't have this social relationship. There was no attachment value from me to her dog. Um, <laughs> and it, it was just weird. So how with neoclassical economics, can you do backflips to explain my college girlfriend who saved her dog's baby teeth? I, I'm, I'm personally not sure that that is in the realm of neoclassical economics. So my more important question is rather than doing backflips to make sense of your ex-girlfriend maybe we can try the other way around which is okay. seeing what kind of practical value these lessons have in agricultural markets so you're in luck we have done some work <laughs> um so the uh so lindy and i since i've been here uh we've published a couple of papers on uh how to apply social capital theory to uh, different markets, not just agricultural, but to a lot of markets. Um, you know, I, I think it's uh, to a, a normal human being, the idea that relationships matter is uh, it's a no brainer. Uh, so it's always kind of strange to talk to economists who don't think that relationships have this in this economic value. Hold on. That, that is that is absolutely not an accurate characterization of how neoclassical economics uh, describe relationships or that relationships don't matter it's just that we have this whole theory called game theory which is pre-built uh and it talks about the interactions of people and how you will make um you will make um things uh, or decisions that are not necessarily in your immediate um own self-interest based on the fact that you don't want to burn bridges, right? We don't know when we're going to be interacting with people in the future. Um, we may have other transactions in the future. And if we just exploit this person right now, um, that will hurt us down the road. So there are, that's a totally inaccurate characterization of neoclassical economics. So I, I guess my question is, how is, this, how is uh, this different uh, than, than so, that? Okay, so let me, let me talk you through a couple papers that Lindy and I have published in the last year or so. Uh, one of them is in ag and food, and another one is in colonoscopies. So, so really, we're, we're some people cover farm to fork, and other people cover different <laughs> systems. Um, you are going um, even beyond farm to fork. <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> um, okay, so farm to John. <laughs> so let's let's start on on the farm side, um, and we'll talk about our Journal of Wine Economics paper. Um, so people talk about local foods all the time. That's a thing that is uh, everybody talks about local foods. Um, and uh, so the question is, what do people value about local foods? Um, and what Lindy and I talked about a lot is that it's not really about the mileage. It's not about how close it actually is. Like, like I don't have like a specific utility for my, uh, like, I don't know, my five mile away neighbor versus my 10 mile away neighbor. Like that's not really the calculation that I'm making. What I'm actually using local foods as a proxy for is my relationship with the item itself. Um, and so we, we ran this study where we looked at localness based on the motives that Lindy's laid out um, as it relates to cider in New York for Michigan consumers versus cider in Michigan. So let's say you go to the grocery store, you have a New York cider and a Michigan cider. Um, and so then we looked at the attachment value motives for those two items. And as you would expect, the attachment value attributed to the Michigan cider for Michigan consumers was much higher. Lindy, can I ask, um, in this context of your paper right here about localness and attachment value, 
to what extent is that um, differentiation based on attachment value or social capital versus differentiation based on um, quality? So a perception of high quality versus um, low quality, geographic indicators as a, as a representation of quality. So great question. And the answer is, you'd have to do a study to, to uh, and say, what you would want to do is measure the relative importance of motives. If you believed that it was simply a quality decision, or maybe a price decision, then the own, own consumption motive would show up fairly high. Um, for example, when we do uh, study motives for buying gasoline, you know, it's probably 90% on consumption, which would be consistent with, you know, economic theory. But when you're getting something like a haircut or voting or recycling, and you're asking, well, what's your motive for doing that? Then the social capital motives become much more important. Well, so, so when, but I, I'm still stuck in the neoclassical world where I'm just thinking about commodity products versus differentiated products. And so the gas example that you gave me was a classic example of a commodity product. Right. Where, where here, this hard cider uh, seems like a much more differentiated product. And so the argument I think you guys are making here is that this differentiation is based on this co uh, concept of local or, or social capital attachment value. Uh, and I'm just wondering if we can assign it to that or if there is some perception of quality um, that is other than local. Well, I'll, I'll let Trey talk about that, but at least according to the motives, there were, there were uh, these social emotional goods that influenced the preference for local products. So there's some consumption of relational goods associated with this, uh, with cider, although I'm not an expert on that. But um, those are empirical questions, really. So, I mean, yeah, let's, let's, uh, let's take a step back, I think, to talk about the this paper specifically, so that we can kind of root into something that we're got hard things. Cool. Okay, so so the first figure is this figure here that looks at the average attachment value motives between. So we're looking at Michigan consumers who are looking at a Michigan cider or a New York cider, and as you would expect, when we ask people like, uh, "Why did you choose this cider? What do you like about this cider over that cider?" the Michigan consumers say that they like the, the sharing motive. They like being a part of the local food product more with the Michigan cider than the New York one, because the New York one, they don't have a relationship to. So that's step one. The problem is that like, okay, so how does that change the way that they choose their product? Maybe they also are confounding with this idea of like Michigan ciders are just higher quality. Um, so what we did is we ran uh, this choice experiment where we added in these motives as an explanatory, as a right-hand side variable to explain the probability that somebody would choose the Michigan cider or the New York cider. And what we found was um, the, uh, the elasticity of social capital in this case was very large relative to the own consumption elasticity. Does that make sense? So it's, it's not really about like the, like in the way we measured own consumption is like, because I like this cider because it tastes good. That was, that's like an own consumption value. And so that didn't explain our uh, probability of choice as well as uh, the social capital variable. Are there, so it, Lindy, are we able to, to uh, take this beyond just this localness thing of attachment values? Can we explain things like fair trade uh, in, the, in the dimension of social capital? So one of the, let me just give you some examples of where we have applied um, this social capital theory. In fact, the, one of the early studies was, uh, and, and, and in those days we were just asking the question, do relationships matter? And so we did this multiple state study on land values and uh, minimum sell prices and how minimum sell prices varied 
on relationships. And so uh, that was sort of one of the early um, results that said, yes, there is no, uh, the, the minimum sell price for land depends on who you're selling, selling it to. And, um, and Trey has mentioned some of the other applications, but uh, one so, of the next studies, go ahead. Uh, so, so that paper is about how, um, like if I'm selling to my friend, um, if I'm selling land, I'm gonna sell that, I'm gonna set that price lower than if I'm selling to a stranger. And so again, that social capital is determining the, uh, the price that I set in my head, my equilibrium or my sale price, um, because I'm, I'm taking into account maybe the repeated game of being friends with the person is the way that maybe a neoclassical economist would say it. But, but like to a, a social capital economist, what they're going to basically say is it's not really about like what I think I can get out of this guy next time. It's just about doing the right thing. You know, so, hold on. So that th makes no sense. Let me, Why? let me, let me put it just a different. Suppose okay, I suppose I want <laughs> to buy an airline ticket and I go in and I can buy, um, I can pay cash. I can pay with accumulated miles or some combination. So think of some kind of ISO reward curve that's made up of combinations of relational goods and money. And I'm going to buy, I'm going to sell my land to someone who is not only going to give me money, but is also going to give me significant relational goods or maybe invest in social capital. So I'm just as well off selling for that combination of commodities and relational goods as I would be selling to a stranger for all money. And so, and I think that's one of the key points that we're trying to make is that when exchanges involve social capital, you have combination, the, the exchange is going to involve combinations of money and relational goods. And you can't explain it simply by looking at the money exchange because there are other things being exchanged. In my mind, it's still hard to separate that from uh, this, this theory of insurance towards future interactions with this person. So, so, um, so I, I think you're not wrong, honestly. I, I think that these two things interact really closely and it's, it's almost in my mind talking about two sides of the same coin. Um, the, the idea of trying to disentangle which event is social capital and which event is repeated games is really hard to do. Fair. So, so I wonder though, I wonder, we, we, you, you guys have talked about social capital and its importance and the importance of relationships. And, and essentially, if I understand correctly, the, the importance of kind of being kind uh yeah. to one another in the in kind of modern day life uh my question is if i look around at the world right now it appears to approximately be burning down uh so does that yeah. is that in conflict with this theory of social capital or is that part of the social capital story too so before we go too down the road i i think i do want to highlight another book um moral tribes uh, so this is from Josh Green, who's a psychologist who studies um, kind of the way that people see the world where they are right versus the other, the others are wrong. Whatever. Us versus them. Yeah. yeah. And so what's nice is Lindy's actually working on a lot of this stuff right now in what he calls cheap social capital. And uh, I think this figure really highlights where I feel like the world is right now. Um, like both sides are like shooting down the other side and thinking that they're it's the other side that's the bad guy but like we hate everybody and like my social media is the worst right now and it's it's this is what's going on so lindy go ahead and use your social capital theory to explain what's going on in the world okay can i can i circle back to your first the earlier question that i'm not sure we so yeah. you you referred to okay am i just sort of building insurance for future interactions. And 
Um, one way I could do that would be have some kind of legal means of enforcing a contract, but social capital, if I indeed have social capital and I internalize your well-being, then you can count on me for uh, preferential treatment or, or being fair or trustworthy or so on. So the answer is social capital does have something to do with uh, guaranteeing uh, positive future interaction. Now, back to the cheap social capital idea is normally, or when we talk about social capital and, and we're talking about it in the sense of Adam Smith, that is, I internalize your well-being somehow. If, I, if something happens bad to you, I'm worse off. Something good happens to you, I'm better off, even though I'm not impacted by it in any direct way. So usually the basis of those are um, what we call uh, commonalities or shared commonalities. And these are either inherited or earned. So inherited would be, we're a member of the same family, uh, we're born in the same place. Uh, anyway, all of these same gender and so on. An earned commonality might be, we went to school together, we pl played on the same team, we have similar interests and so on. So that's the, the way we normally talk about building social capital. And, and uh, there's a, a really interesting book on tribes by Junger that talks about the shared uh, experience of soldiers. And I guess you could talk about the shared experience of people that went through 9-11, something intensely emotional that was shared can be the basis of a very strong bond. But let's say you're engaged in a political campaign and you don't have this sort of social capital that's produced in cottage industries, so to speak. And the answer is, how do I form a network of support if I don't have social capital and the answer is, we're seeing increasingly efforts to build uh, networks by finding people with whom we can agree to hate or disdain the same cause or person. And so this connection between us called cheap social capital because it's so inexpensive to form and limited in use is based on the shared um, disdain, dislike, disregard of another person or cause. So let's take and, a step back further. Let's talk about the paper that you've got where you look at social capital over time. Do we have more or less social relationships now than we used to? It's hard, it's hard to say because the distribution is changing. So we talked about these um, bonding, these really intense tight bonds these sort of linking bonds between colleagues and then these asymmetric bonds, which are called bridging. There are some communities um, where it's just, you could describe it as um, a bonded social capital and other communities where it's more of a linking relationship. Um, interestingly, we sometimes have students from uh, different places uh, developing in the developing world that don't want or are a little hesitant to go back because they will rejoin a bonding network and have limited and their resources basically uh, belong to everyone. So it's, it's um, I'm not sure how I would answer, I, what I would say is, I think we see an increasing dependence on cheap social capital. Um, and uh, the social media seems to um, encourage us to communicate with people that have similar ideas and values. And, um, and, you... and we see less compromises, less working across the aisle politically, I think there is surely evidence for increases 
in cheap social capital. And when we talked yesterday, uh, I asked you, what exactly do we mean? You've got here cheap in, in quotations. What do we mean by the word cheap? Does that mean uh, low cost or um, what, do you, what, do you mean, mean, what do you mean by cheap? So if let's say that you and I build social capital. That may involve us spending time together, going to dinner together, spending time um, uh, talking. Maybe we go on vacation. Anyway, we could invest a lot of time building social capital. Um, building cheap social capital, all it requires is to identify someone that you both hate or both have disregard for. For example, um, you might refer to um, uh, people from another country as, 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 as having undesirable qualities and you say, oh yes, I feel the same way. And without the expense that you would go through to build cheap social gap, you've already created some kind of connection. So one meaning of the word cheap is it doesn't cost a whole lot to create. Another meaning of the, the word cheap is you can't uh, use it for very much. I mean, it, it has limited use. Well, so, so talk more about that because I feel like it is of paramount use in, in modern politics and is a big factor, certainly in the 2016 election and, and, and even more so in the 2020 presidential election. Well, it, it surely seems like in the 2016 and, and this election, um, I don't think we, well, you know, early on, I suppose the, there were some pretty raucous uh, presidential debates early on in the history of our country, but I don't, I don't think you've seen a presidential debate where um, <laughs> you had the candidates calling each other clowns or, you know, <laughs> I mean, you know, the. Yeah, so the it's definitely level. cheap social capital. It's the, the, I, I totally buy that, but, but it seems to be fairly valuable, valuable. but cheap to, de cheap to develop. <laughs> right. Um, well, I mean, uh, as long as you keep, uh, uh, calling, calling your rivals out and keep emphasizing the, uh, you know, the, the negative qualities. And I think that's supported by the uh, social media that picks up on that and helps us um, organize ourselves into tribes, if you will. Yeah. And uh, I think one of you, was it you, Alex, that talked about you can even have cheap social capital organized around the kind of music that you prefer. So, um, so, so let me unpack that because that, that is something I think is really interesting. Um, so I listen to country music a lot. Um, I am a, I'm a diehard red dirt country music guy. I love the Turnpike Troubadours, Cody Canada, etc. If I listen to new country, so like the Nashville country that you hear on the radio, all of it is about how I'm more country than you are. I'm from the sticks. You're not. Than they are. Than they are. Yeah. Yeah. Us versus them. Yeah. No. Yeah. Right. Um, so, uh, you know, there's a song. He can't even bait a hook. And the whole thing is about how, like, I'm country and he's not country. And why would you ever be with somebody who's not a part of our team? Um, and, and like, so there are songs that, like, in my mind, embody this idea of cheap social capital because it's trying to highlight how different the, uh, I don't know that in group is versus uh, the, these others. And what matters is the versus part. It's not, it's not really about like my regular life. Um, so if I listen to like old school country, like Hank Williams senior, I'm going to get like a discussion of just life and relationships. If I listen to even Hank Williams junior, it's going to be more about a me versus them. A country boy will survive. My uh, my buddy in uh, downtown New York City, he got shot to death. 
Hold on. But, but so, yes, I, I totally agree with that. And I think it's interesting. But in terms of the stakes of understanding the impacts of cheap social capital uh, and the implications of the world, certainly it's less um, catastrophic than things like like politics. Uh, and so when we look at the world of politics and we're saying you watch the presidential debate and it's basically just yelling at each other about how stupid right. the other side is, it looks exactly like this picture, right? We've, we're tearing the world apart with, with right. this concept of cheap social capital. So <laughs> on the one end, maybe it's low cost and maybe it's low value, but when we look at the state of our world it's very costly uh in another right. sense in terms of the I, that it can do I, I i agree with what you're saying that there really are um there are potentially catastrophic costs of cheap social capital so if we make china and into an enemy if we make mexico into an enemy um they're profound but I, I, I would like to mention at least an, an area where cheap social capital is uh, pretty um, dominant. It would be hard to have uh, athletic events without creating cheap social capital out of your opponent. And sometimes those rivalries go beyond just, you know, an afternoon sporting event. Sometimes they can be something more than that. In fact, uh, and a, another example is almost every, um, I, I guess, drama has to create a, a, a cheap social capital with someone to carry the uh, theme. And um, so uh, it, 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 may, it may be cheap, but it's it's becoming increasingly pervasive. And, um, and I, I, I wonder what the limits are. And, and so is there, I guess, in, this, in the last four minutes we've got here, is there a remedy for the damage created by this cheap social capital? Oh, absolutely. And the answer, and the answer is um, we need shared projects. We need shared goals, uh, which might be include environmental, uh, tra you know, something that we could agree is important that we could work together on. Surely we could agree that, uh, that solving the uh, coronavirus uh, pandemic is a goal that we could all unite around. I'm not even and sure we can agree on that. I think so I, a lot of people, yeah, go for it, Dre. So I, uh, it might be self-serving, but we are in luck because um, actually I have a paper with a graduate student from Michigan State and Jason Lusk. I always have to mention the name, but um, the, uh, where in AEPP, we look at polarization in food and ag policy. And if anything, the two sides have actually come together on their opinions on what we should be doing in food and ag policy, um, which is kind of shocking to me. So we looked at data from uh, 2011 versus data in 2018. And over that period of time, if anything, there's been a convergence in opinions of what we should be doing with policy specific things. Um, now, that's not true for everything. Like some of them have stayed as polarized as they were before. Uh, but, but there are certain things like promoting local food systems, uh, like um, supporting restaurants, uh, like trying to figure out how poor people eat um, like there are things that we actually agree on on both sides of the aisle. And, and part of the beauty is we maybe we could rally around the, uh, the, the, the real social capital of food and agriculture. What do you think, Lindy? I agree. I agree. I don't think there is, a, if, if you wanted to choose a thing with high attachment value, it would be food because we use it so often to build social capital, to exchange relational goods, to celebrate uh, holidays. I mean, if there were a study uh, apt for social capital, it would be food. So it has, I think it has wonderful potential as a policy uh, goal 
for creating social capital. And, um, and I think we all worry about the current sort of uh, emphasis on cheap social capital in politics um, because they're, they're, we can do so much more if we cooperate and um, instead of viewing uh, our ability to win requiring somebody else to lose. Well, we lost Alex, but I think you're right. Um, so let's, as we are kind of concluding our hour here, Lindy, I, you've been in the department at Michigan State University in AFRI since for a long time. Yes. Uh, <laughs> so you are kind of rotating out uh, you're in, in your, I think, trying to figure out kind of your next steps and everything else. Yeah. If you could look back and think about kind of, especially in the context of social capital, what we might be able to glean from that for, for not just nationally with politics being the way that it is, but even locally, like how, how those of us that are still here can engage with each other and develop these relationships that you're, you're kind of very much talking into. So over the years in the department, uh, I've, I've talked about departments being organized as talent shows or orchestras. And a talent show, everyone has their song or dance and they do it individually and they people clap or they get rewarded individually versus an orchestra where we complement each other. We produce something that someone alone couldn't produce. And so I would hope that as we go forward in the department, we bring in a set of diverse skills and backgrounds and interests, and we look for ways that we can complement each other's strengths and uh, find, uh, and, and nothing builds social capital like working together on a shared project that, um, that becomes, um, you know, successful and, and helps. So, I guess if I had a wish for the department, it would be that, of course, there are some things that we have to do as a um, as a talent show. We get promoted or individually, but there's so many things that we could do uh, and do better um, as as an orchestra. I think the thing that has been most rewarding for me is being able to find colleagues that are willing to cooperate and learning so much, seeing uh, different uh, approaches. And I think that will, what will help us continue to have a, a really, not only a strong department, but a place where people come and, and enjoy working and, and being with their colleagues. Well, that's a uh, nice sentiment. I hope that maybe we can uh, step in that direction. Lindy, I know that my, uh, my, my, one of my favorite things in the last three years is my ability to have worked with you. It's been awesome to publish the last three papers we've done together. Um, you know, in terms of social capital, I, I'm very excited to keep working on that topic with you. Um, thank you so much for joining us. I'm glad we could kind of take a step back and, and talk about where the world is in terms of social relationships and where we might be able to go. Uh, thank, so, you. Yeah. thank you. Thank you. Thank you for inviting us. me, uh, yeah. Trey and Alex. It's a, always a pleasure to see you guys take over and lead us to greater things. Thanks so awesome. much, Lindy. Thanks. Take Good care, to be with everybody. You. Bye, guys.